In the first month of 2024, we observed the continuation of the trends of the past three to four months as the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine continues. Russia has the initiative. It is attacking at different levels of intensity on most front sectors. Even though the Russian army's advance has continued to be incremental and its offensive underwhelming, Putin remains confident of his long game. Welcome to the January 2024 update from the war in Ukraine. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! Cold and snowy winter weather is making its mark on the battlefield. It decreases visibility for drones, which have become extremely important in Ukraine. It causes malfunction of vehicles and military equipment. It makes the lives of soldiers miserable, lowering their morale. The Russians are putting pressure on the Ukrainian defenses on almost all sectors of the front. The Avdiivka stronghold remains the key goal of its currently ongoing offensive as a crucial stepping stone for further offensive operations in Donbass. Heavy battles are ongoing in the south of Avdiivka, north of Vodiana, around Stepova, Novobak Mativka and Novokalinova. The biggest achievement of the Russian army in January in the Avdiivka sector was the capture of the Saska Ohota restaurant, turned into a stronghold by the Ukrainian army in the south. Both Ukrainian and Russian sources reported about an operation by Russian military intelligence which moved through underground pipes for two kilometers to emerge behind the backs of the Ukrainians. This was followed by the Pyatnashka Brigade and the 10th Tank Regiment, solidifying Russian control over this stronghold, which has withstood Ukrainian counterattacks as of early February. In the Bakhmut section, a slow Russian advance has largely turned into a positional battle as well. The Russian army has gained some ground in Bodinivka and around Klitschivka, but this progress has been minimal. Elsewhere in Donbass, Russia has been trying to develop its advance following the capture of Marienka. Initially, they captured the industrial area of Novomikhailivka in the south of Marienka, but on January 9th the Ukrainians pushed them back. The Russians later advanced westwards from Novomikhailivka. In this period, the Russians also captured Vesela. To summarize, the Russians have continued making gains in Donbass, but they are very, very far from completing the capture of this region, which is one of the main political goals of Russia in this war at this point. A similar situation has developed on the North Luhansk front as well. The Russians have been attacking here since the summer of 2023, but their advance has been minimal. They have been trying to capture Sinkivka with an aim to advance on Kupiansk later but the Ukrainians have been repulsing the vast majority of Russian attacks, taking advantage of the high ground on the left bank of the Oskil. The Russians have been losing a lot of equipment on this axis. Further south, the Russian army captured the villages of Krokmalna and Tabaivka, along with advancing towards Berestova and around Bilohirivka, but this is minor progress considering the losses the Russians have suffered here. For months, battles have been going on around the PO7 highway, the Zherebets River and the Serebriansky forest. On the Zaporizhia front, the back and forth between the two sides in the Robotina salient continues. There has not been any significant movement in this area since the completion of the Ukrainian counter-offensive. It has decisively turned into a secondary front of the war in Ukraine at this point. There have been no significant changes in Krinky either. Russian sources claimed several times that they were on the brink of capturing the Ukrainian bridgehead, but the Ukrainian marines are still in control of Krinky. Still, they have yet to properly expand the bridgehead and face non-stop Russian fire, shelling and attacks. According to the Ukrainian military intelligence chief Kirillo Budinov, the Russian winter offensive, which has been going on for two and a half months, has the goal to reach the administrative borders of Donetsk and Luhansk blasts, but needless to say they are far from reaching this goal at this moment. Budinov argues that the Russian offensive will be exhausted by spring. 
but many others actually expect the Russian army to expand the geography of its operations. The Financial Times even argues that the Russians might attack the Hesano Blast and Kyiv once again. Others expect them to target Kharkiv, which is mere kilometers away from the Russian border. Putin stated on January 31st that one of the aims of the Russian army is to create a so-called cordon sanitaire zone on the Russo-Ukrainian border in order to prevent the Ukrainians from launching drones and missiles on Russian border towns. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians are building defensive lines and fortifications along the line of contact, which have already proven their effectiveness in this war. Both sides have also continued striking each other's military assets and civilian infrastructure in January. The Russians launch drones and missiles on Ukraine almost daily. Unlike the previous campaign of winter bombardment, this time Russia's main focus is not on Ukraine's energy infrastructure, but its defense industry. Since foreign military support has diminished in recent months, the Ukrainian government has been working on ramping up domestic military production. The success of these drone and missile strikes, in terms of damaging the Ukrainian defense industry, is not entirely clear. The Russians regularly report about the destruction of Ukrainian bases and military production plants, but we mainly see images and footage of destroyed residential buildings. In this period, we have seen evidence of Russia using North Korean ballistic missiles, with a range of 900 kilometers. Even though North Korean missiles are not exactly precise, they can still do a lot of damage. The Russians have also started using a modified version of Shahed drones, the Shahed 238, which has a higher speed, but its production cost is higher and the range is lower. The Ukrainian Strategic Industries Minister Kamishin announced on January 18th that Ukrainian air defense has already started using Frankensam hybrid systems based on the Soviet book launchers firing American air defense missiles and has already downed a Shahed drone from a distance of 9 kilometers. In contrast, the Ukrainians have mostly been focusing on destroying Russia's air defense and air force assets. On January 4th, Ukrainian military intelligence reported about the destruction of a Su-34 fighter jet in Chelyabinsk. Ten days later, the Ukrainians claimed the destruction of a rare and expensive A-50 airborne early warning and control plane, and the damaging of an IL-20M airborne command post over the Azov Sea. Patriot Pak-2 air defense missiles were most likely used in this attack. A-50s give a 200-mile range of visibility to the Russians, which are crucial in launching fighter and bomber jets in Ukraine. Now Russia has only two to eight A-50 planes left, with at least some of them requiring repair or not being flown in years. Ukrainian drones have also attacked oil and gas infrastructure, fuel depots, the Smolensk aviation plant, and Shiglovsky Val plant in Tula, and other targets in Russia in this period. The strikes on oil infrastructure have been particularly painful, as the Russian Ministry of Energy reported that fuel exports have dropped by 37% in January 2024. On January 31st, the Ukrainians struck the Velbek airfield in Crimea, destroying a Su-30 and two Su-27 jets. One of the more controversial episodes of the recent months took place on January 24th. A Russian IL-76 transport aircraft crashed in Belgorod Oblast of Russia. The Russians have stated that the plane was carrying 65 Ukrainian prisoners of war and was shot down by Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have responded by claiming that the plane was carrying S-300 missiles. So far, as of early February, the Russians have not provided any evidence of the death of Ukrainian POWs in this crash. On the other hand, a Ukrainian military intelligence spokesperson has confirmed that there was going to be a prisoner exchange on January 24th. Much has been said about how the war in Ukraine has transformed into positional trench warfare, in which artillery becomes extremely important. According to the Wall Street Journal, Russia fires around 10,000 shells every day, against 2,000 fired by the Ukrainians. The peak of Ukrainian artillery use came during the summer counteroffensive, in which they fired some 8,000 shells per day. It is worth noting that while the Russians are using more artillery shells than the Ukrainians now, it is significantly less than what they fired in 2022, especially during the fight for Severodonetsk. According to Ukrainian military intelligence official Vadim Skibitsky, Russia produced up to 2,122 or 152 mm artillery shells in 2023 and got 1 million more from North Korea, which has enabled the Russian army to maintain a decent firepower capacity. In October 2023, it was reported that the European Union had supplied Ukraine with only 30% of the pledged 1 million shells. 
Ukraine has increased the domestic production of shells, but this is not going to be enough to achieve parity with the Russians. That is why Ukraine's allies have been working to ramp up their production too. For instance, the US has doubled its production to 28,000 per month in October 2023, and some of it will most likely go to Ukraine once or if Congress agrees to extend the Ukraine funding. Germany has delivered 9,000 shells in 2024 already, while Britain, Latvia and the Netherlands pledged more artillery rounds for Ukraine too. On January 13th, the Swedish company Namo agreed to increase 155mm artillery shell production for Ukraine, while the French Armed Forces Minister Le Canu announced a plan to create an artillery coalition of 23 nations to send more artillery to the Ukrainian army. Lastly, on January 23rd, NATO declared that it will produce 155mm artillery shells worth $1.2 billion for Ukraine, but the bad news is that the first batch will only arrive in late 2025. There is finally more movement in the West to send much-needed shells to Kyiv, but Ukraine will need more to at least achieve parity on the battlefield. Kamishin also promised a 42-fold increase of production of ammunition and a 2.5-fold increase of production of shells. Kamishin declared that Ukraine had restarted the manufacturing of Vilka MLRS with a 130km range and a more explosive warhead. Since 2023, Ukraine has been producing six Bodana howitzers per month. They have increased production of anti-tank missiles like Stugna P and Corsar. The minister stated that Ukraine has repaired more than 3,000 armoured vehicles since 2022 while also claiming a five-fold increase in their production between the spring of 2023 and December 2023. According to him, there has also been a 100-fold increase in the production of drones since the start of the war, while Ukraine is also working on modernizing Neptune missiles and electronic warfare systems. This is decent progress in comparison with where things were at the beginning of the war, but not nearly enough to ensure parity with Russia. According to an article in The Telegraph, Russia has also significantly increased its domestic production after losing thousands of vehicles and weapon systems in the two years of the war. Currently, Russia is turning bakeries, malls and other civilian objects into arms production facilities, which work in three shifts. Western sources have told The New York Times that Russia is expected to manufacture 2 million shells in 2024, while the British Ministry of Defense stated that Russia is capable of producing at least 100 main battle tanks per month a pace which allows them to overcome the massive armoured losses they have been suffering in Ukraine. Both sides are also modernising their electronic warfare capabilities and drones. Ukrainian sources have estimated the effectiveness of FPV drone usage by their operators to be at 30%, a figure which often depends on the capabilities of the unit. Again, according to Ukrainian sources, Russia has modernised their FPV drones, which are not vulnerable to Ukrainian electronic warfare tools. Ukrainian industry has just started working on manufacturing such drones. Russian electronic warfare has also been modernized and according to the Financial Times, they are now capable of disorienting precision HIMARS and Excalibur missiles. Meanwhile, the AFU has started using ground unmanned mine trawlers, ground unmanned kamikaze vehicles and ground drones named Brennenesets equipped with M2 machine guns. It is also important to talk about the report about the dismissal of the Ukrainian commander-in-chief Zelushny. Several Ukrainian journalists broke this news, but the Ukrainian government later denied it. However, soon the Western media also started reporting about the imminent dismissal of Zelushny. As of February 1st, there has been no official news regarding this. It is rumoured that the commander of the ground forces, Suski, and the chief of military intelligence, Budinov, are the main candidates to replace Zelushny. In our previous videos, we discussed the tension between Zelensky and Zelushny, and if the reports are true, the decision will be made official fairly soon. Surely it is the prerogative of the civilian government to make decisions about the country's military, but Zelushny is very popular in Ukraine and has solid rapport with his Western counterparts. He is the commander who masterminded the defense of Ukraine in the first days of the war, and the successful counter-offensives in Kharkiv and Kherson Oblasts. Perhaps the Ukrainian government believes that following a failed summer counter-offensive, the army needs a shake-up. Still unresolved is the matter of further mobilization in Ukraine, which is said to be a topic of dispute between the political and military leadership. Some claim that Zelensky is concerned with the popularity of Zelushny. If the dismissal indeed happens, we will know the reason as well pretty soon.
even though Zeluzhny was on good footing with his Western colleagues, his potential dismissal is extremely unlikely to have any impact on military aid from Western countries. There is still no development coming from the United States. US officials have already stated that they have run out of budget to send military support to Ukraine. They need Congress to approve the budget for military support to Ukraine, which the Republican majority insists to link with the border deal. The State Department has reiterated that it will continue supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes, but added that assistance may not be at the level of 2022 and 2023. The upcoming couple of months will likely show which way the United States goes with regard to military aid in Ukraine. On December 31st, the State Department official Victoria Newland confirmed that the United States has sent Ukraine the ground-launched small-diameter bombs, which will expand the range of Ukraine's HIMARS. Expansion of long-range precision fire capabilities is a good development for Ukraine. And even better news for Kyiv is the adoption of the much-awaited EU package of support, worth 50 billion euros, to be given until 2027, after the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban backed down from his demands. On January 4th, Germany delivered a new military aid package, which included a Skynex air defense system, 10 Marda infantry fighting vehicles, ammunition for Leopard 2 tanks, missiles for Iris-T air defense systems, TRML-4D radars, two Vicent mine-clearing vehicles, Bieber bridge-laying vehicles, and so on. Later, Germany also announced military aid worth 7 billion euros, which included ammunition for Leopard 1 tanks, drones, and communication equipment. Later, they pledged to deliver six decommissioned Sea King Mark 41 helicopters to Ukraine. On January 6, Danish Ministry of Defense officials informed that their F-16 delivery will be postponed by half a year. Initially, the delivery was expected to happen in early 2024. On January 7, the Japanese Foreign Minister Kamikawa pledged to send a drone detection system and other equipment. On January 11, the Estonian president announced a 1.2 billion euro aid package to Ukraine. On the same day, the Latvian president also pledged military aid, including unnamed howitzers, anti-tank weapons, rockets, helicopters, drones and other weapons. Later, Latvia announced the creation of a coalition of 20 countries committed to sending drones to Ukraine. On January 12, British Prime Minister Sunak visited Ukraine and pledged £2.5 billion of military support which will pay for air defense systems, long-range missiles, and artillery shells, as we mentioned before. They also signed a security agreement in which Britain committed to continue supporting Ukraine militarily and economically. On January 16th, the French President Macron stated that France will give 40 scalp long-range missiles, French equivalents of storm shadows, along with several hundred bombs. The French government also announced its intention to send 68 Caesar self-propelled howitzers to Ukraine and train Ukrainian soldiers, along with delivering two LRU rocket launches. The Europeans are picking up the pace to compensate for the recent American inaction. Meanwhile, Russia is increasing its military production, buying missiles and artillery shells from North Korea and drones from Iran, while also reportedly negotiating the purchase of missiles from the latter. The ex-president of Russia and the current deputy chair of the Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, has clearly expressed Russia's vision of Ukraine. Existence of an independent state on historical Russian territories will now always be a cause for the renewal of military actions. Moreover, there is a 100% probability of a new conflict whichever pieces of paper on security the West signs with the Kyiv puppet regime. That does not exactly sound like a message of peace and openness to honest negotiations. Russia is attacking and believes that it can outproduce the West and Ukraine. The Kremlin will hope for the fragmentation of the Western coalition amidst Ukraine fatigue, while Ukraine continues to defend hard and makes further defensive preparations. Let's look at the visually confirmed equipment losses of both sides documented by the Oryx military blog. As of February 1st, Russia has lost at least 2,678 tanks, 5,615 vehicles, 268 command posts and communication stations, 1,116 artillery systems and vehicles, 346 multiple rocket launches, 102 aircraft, 135 helicopters, and 333 drones. Ukraine has lost at least 736 tanks, 2,326 vehicles, 18 command posts and communication stations, 489 artillery systems and vehicles, 52 multiple rocket launchers, 79 aircraft, 37 helicopters, and 258 drones. 
More episodes on this conflict are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.